Okay, we're going to briefly look at how to do some processing of magnetic data. And so what you need is this menu up at the top, MagMap. If you don't have it, you go to GX, Load Menu, scroll down till you find MagMap, <coughs> click Open, and then it'll appear in the top um, menu bar here. So click on MagMap, and then click on MagMap One Step Filtering. So what I'm going to do is put my input grid, and so I can see the name of my input grid here, um, TMI Bushveld LO27, I select that, and then I click the name of the output grid. So this is the file you're going to create. I like to replicate exactly what I've got in my input file name and then add in whatever I'm going to do to it. So that's my input file name first and then underscore VD means I'm going to take the vertical derivative. Name or control file. Click on here. You should have a control file in the folder. If not and you can't find one anywhere, it's a .con file. Send me an email and I'll send it to you. Now we click on filter and now you can choose the type of filter that you want. Mm. You can see there's a ton of them. Let's for now just do derivative. You can do a horizontal derivative or vertical. I'm going to do vertical and I'm just going to do to the first order. So, And I click OK. Click OK. And it generates the image for you. Let's put them next to each other and click here and click on this small brown square in the middle to compare them to each other. So you can see it's quite a noisy vertical derivative. Um, it's, you can mainly see a lot of the flight lines coming through and it's because this is a, a regional data set that had a lot of um, grids added together and so not too much effort was put into leveling. Some other things that you can do if you go back to MagMap, your analytic signal and your tilt derivative also help you to look at um, high frequency shallow features. Let's look at your tilt derivative here. Again, choose your input grid. I'm again going to choose my Bushveld LO27. Now you're going to choose your output grid. Um, one of the easiest things to do is I just yeah. click on the same thing, click Save, and then <coughs> change it. So TDR is your tilt derivative <coughs> grid. And let's do it again here. And this is your horizontal derivative of the tilt derivative grid. I find this very noisy, so I don't often look at it, but you have to generate it. And I click the Z derivative method, I stick with FFT. You can look around to what the benefits of the different methods are. Click OK. And you can see this is the horizontal derivative, the tilt derivative, and it is very noisy. Um, here we have the tilt derivative. Again, quite noisy. It can be beneficial in areas to look at for shallow features. You can see the outside here. Um, in general, this is quite a noisy grid, so it's not, not a great example. Something else that's great to look at is the analytic signal. When looking at the analytic signal, I would suggest using the reduced to pole grid. And so how you do that, um, sorry, it's actually a bit more complicated. Let me just find... Okay, so what you need to f know first before you do you need to know the IGRF, so the magnetic field um, details at the time that the survey was flown. And so what you need to do first is you need to create a database. And in that database you need to put the longitude, latitude and elevation of your survey area. So these are very approximate because you've got quite a big area. And then you need to use this IGRF menu. Um, it should be, again, if you go GX load menu, scroll down IGRF and you click open mm. it'll come up here so once you've got these three columns you're going to click on IGRF, IGRF channel mm -hmm. you're going to choose IGRF auto here's the date of your mm. survey you can see I am not really sure of the date of my survey I know it was in 1980s 0101 so there is a slight error here input channels longitude I choose my longitude channel that I've already put in my latitude channel I put in my elevation channel these output channels you are going to have to do yourself. So literally you're going to have to click on your database, you're going to have to type in the heading, type in the heading, type in the heading, and you push enter after each one. And so if we go back here, you will choose these headings. And once I click OK, it's going to input these values. So you can see I've done this once before. Once I click OK, I'm going to get the intensity value, the inclination, and the declination. Now why we need these is because when we go map, ma mag map, MagMap one step filtering and we are now going to do the reduced pole RTP and 
you're going to click on filter, you're going to scroll down here and go to reduce to magnetic pole. You actually have to put in the inclination and declination at the time the survey was collected. That's why you need these values. So minus 63, I'm not sure how the accuracy, uh, minus 5.7. Amplitude correction, you can read up about it, it isn't necessary. I think the default is 1. Oh no, sorry, default is plus 20 in the northern hemisphere and minus 20 in the southern hemisphere. So I know that this is minus 20. I think if you left it blank, it would do the default anyway. Click OK and click OK. And so what reduce to pole does is it moves your magnetic anomalies directly over the causative body. So in magnetics, we know that you have a positive and a negative, and so it's the point where you're moving from positive to negative is usually where your body is, assuming there's no remnant magnetization. Yeah. Whereas now um, you are pretending you're at the pole, and so the body, the anomaly is directly yeah. over the body, so oh it's yeah. shifting it. So let's, for yeah. example, look at our original grid yeah. here. If I click on this join between yeah. the positive and the negative, you can see we've kind of lost yeah. a lot of the negative. There's a bit of a positive, so there is the shift. The problem here is that we're in the Bushveld complex. Um, there's a lot of room in magnetization, so it's not 100% accurate to do this, but um, it's a lot of people do it. They, they will take the reduced to pole and then do the analytic signal. You would just need to write in your report what you've done so people know what they're looking at. Um, so you can see now this circular body has really come a lot, um, spread a lot to the south. So you can see here's the, the southern part of the body on the original map and now it has moved a bit to the south. So it's, yeah, it is a difficult thing to say whether it's always useful, it's definitely more useful in newer terrains where there isn't remnant magnetization. But let's look for now, we're going to go mag map, analytic signal, input grid is this reduced to pole grid that we've just created, so you can see it down here. Again, I like to just take everything that, I, um, that I've written and add one more of what I'm doing here. So now I am doing the analytic signal AS. So this is the other 27 grid, it's been reduced to pole and I'm just taking the analytic signal. I keep FFT and I click OK and so let's again put it next to our grid so we can see what we're seeing. Again it helps us um, see shallower features and so you can see it's picking up these strong bodies that we see on the original magnetics. It's also picking up here, you've got a northwest dark, I'm sorry, an east-west dark. So another interesting thing to look at. So we've looked at so far three different things to look at. Shallow bodies, so the vertical derivative, the analytic signal, and the, um, sorry, the tilt derivative. Something to look at for deeper bodies. So let's put in our original grid, and now I'm going to do LP50. So that's a low-pass filter with a 50 cutoff. And I'll show you what that means. Filter, I'm going to go here to low-pass. Uh, wavelength cutoff, so you can see when you read it, it says the cutoff wavelength in ground units, so my map is in meters, so that's the units. All wavelengths shorter than this value will be removed. So I'm going to try 50, and it's 50,000, so it's 50 kilometers. Click OK, and so now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the deeper features in my map. And you're really going to have to play around with that wavelength cutoff. Um, I just used 50 because it was in another area I was looking at, it was useful. And so this is helping us looking at deeper features. We've um, cut out all the shallower stuff, and so you can see it would suggest that this region here, it's a deeper feature, but you've always got to just be careful of um, understanding what your magnetic data is showing you. Let's do it again and do it for 70 filter. And let's just change this to 70. So interesting, I'm not that familiar with this area, so I'm not going to try and interpret this data. Let's try it one more time, filter with 20, and don't forget to change it on your um, file name. Okay, so this is um, starting to look a bit more familiar to the original images with your highs and your lows. There's
this low coming through here. So it's just trying to see um, if a signal has disappeared, it obviously means it's quite a shallow feature in your data. Because if it's sticking around when you're doing a low pass filter, these are obviously deeper features. So let's look if there's anything else that I can tell you about. So go through it yourself. The Butterworth um, band pass filters can be quite useful. Um, cosine directional derivatives um, here can help you if you've got a feature coming through in one direction of the map and you want to take it out to focus on features in another direction. And there's some high pass filtering you can look at. Upward continuation I've already done a vi video on. So there's a ton of different filters here that you can apply. Today we've looked at how to focus on shallow features and deep features. So give it a try.